morning, everybody. This is the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee. We're meeting on Friday, the 28th of August, and we appreciate you being here. It's good to see everyone. Uh, what we are working on right now it has to do directly with our budget, as well as any COVID-related issues. And so we had a nice conversation on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to continue that conversation for a little bit and then move with uh, Diane Botfeld and then move to agriculture. And <clears throat> there have been some questions that have come up. People have emailed me. And um, so we're gonna be trying to figure out uh, how some of this might figure in terms of, I, I also had an early morning conversation with Chip Conquest as we try to figure out to how we um, uh, make our recommendations to the Appropriations Committee by Wednesday, um, well, by the end of business on Wednesday. And if, um, if we are going to potentially make some small changes to the parameters of the grant programs, where exactly that might come into play. And whether that happens in the actual budget or if Commerce, I did not have a chance to talk to Charlie Kimball this morning, uh, but I'm going to consult, the, consult Charlie and Mike Marcotte as we try and figure this out. So um, with that, um, Diane, thank you so much for being with us again today. Um, I have had, I. I I heard one recommendation from the committee um, on Wednesday and Rodney recommended that we potentially increase or recommend that money for working lands be increased to what it was or as much as we could, po well, Rodney, I don't wanna speak for you, but I would, as much as they could possibly come up with. Do you wanna say something? Well, I just, given the times and what's happening in the dairy industry, um, I can foresee a need for more funding that would go through the work and lands initiative as time goes on. I mean, it, you know, just myself, you know I mean, I got some thing, ideas in mind that I might do, but it wouldn't, nothing that's going to happen so later this fall or probably through the winter. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure others are, are in the same boat that are trying to switch their commodity that they want to produce. And I just, you know, we're not getting much. Well, and, and for me anyways, but, you know, I stopped milking cows. I'll probably get a little bit from the one month milk maybe, but I won't get anything else. I tried applying for, uh, well, the initial PPP plan didn't cover self-employed. And then I tried to file, I was going to file for the business grant that did uh, cover self-employed. However, if you're a white male owner, you're not eligible for that grant. And um, so, you know, there's, there's not really, the people that stop milking cows kind of caught in the middle of this whole pandemic and not really getting any significant help financially. So, you know, maybe I can just foresee a, a little more need for working lands later in the year or springtime for what people might end up trying to do. So they don't put their land on the market. Okay, thank, thanks, Rodney. Uh, Diane, do you wanna to respond to that at all? Well, the, uh, the base funding is still in the budget of 594,000 um, of general funds. That is still there. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, we uh, withdrew the one-time potential funding of 750,000, that request was withdrawn. Um, so uh, always, you know, we support the governor's budget as submitted, but if there were further grant funds to expend, we have the uh, ability and process to do so in the working lands if, if that did occur. So, okay. 
So, it, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. So, if all the funds don't get dispersed in the in the dairy assistance program, because I know some farmers that aren't even going to sign up because they don't think they'll get enough to say so, um, and and I I don't I try to encourage them to sign up anyways, but uh, anyways. Uh, is there any way that any of that fund can be diverted to anything but unemployment? That is all in statute. So that is, state there are, statute. Uh, have to go back and look, state statute. Um, I believe the secretary has some ability to, and that was to move non-dairy working lands funds back into dairy. So I do not believe there's any mechanism to, to move unspent dairy funds into anything else at this point in statute. Yes, there was that overall CARES Act that if it's not for the state overall, I believe, not if everything, and this is where there's been a lot of different gyrations on this, and maybe uh, Michael Grady has a better handle on this, but overall, if it's not expended by the 20th of December, then funds go to unemployment but that is there's a lot of different bills out there and a lot of different state bills and a lot of different dates in there so i don't want to be the one quoted as that's the final mm. date so uh, maybe mike o'grady has a better handle on all those different gyrations i know in the dairy and the non-dairy working lands we have to we have a deadline of the 30th september to accept applications and processing those applications will depending on the quality, you know, when we go back out and say something's incomplete and somebody brings it back to us and we give them three tries to get it right on the incomplete aspect. And so, you know, there's a week between each one of those. So at least potentially three weeks and then another um, potentially week and a half to two weeks to process it through to the check. So we think if September 30th is maintained as the deadline, we'll wrap everything up by November 15th at the latest, all money's out the door, checks written. And so depending on, it's all this question of timeline of, um, you know, if, if you as legislators choose to expend, extend deadlines, if you choose to put language in of, of um, you know, who, where, where the money goes if it's not spent, um, but the, the hard and fast for all of this CARES Act money is um, expended by December 30th by the feds or they start taking it back. That one I know for sure. So there isn't a way to extend it unless something happens in Washington DC to extend beyond December 30th. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, deadline dates resting on either Vermont legislature or, or uh, feds around these, these expenditures of these funds. So okay. I think the internally the the um, money that is with the working lands, the 594,000 is general fund money to be expended within fiscal year 21, which goes until June 30th, 2021. Okay, Mike, I saw your hand up. Um, did you wanna comment? Uh, first, I think everything that Diane said is accurate. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Senate Ag, uh, has been discussing similar questions. Uh, one of the things that they will look at is language that allows the secretary to reallocate unexpended money in any of the three funds, dairy assistance, non-dairy or working lands for an, one or more of the other programs where there is increased demand. So uh, Representative Graham, for example, if not all of the dairy assistance money is used because some farmers just aren't going to apply, the, the secretary would have the ability to um, reallocate that money to working lands or to the non-dairy program. So that, that's an option that, that Senate Ag is, is looking to put on the table, and they'll probably look at language on that either by the end of today or early next week. Okay. And, um, for, oops, pardon me, Madam No, go, no, go ahead, Diane. 
Um, Representative Graham, I, I, I know we've heard from some farms that they're not going to apply. It's extremely disappointing. Even the organic dairies are receiving payments. Their, their change in price back to January, the organic price through July, their organic price declines, even if it's based on their component levels, because some are grazing, less butterfat, less protein, that price is declining. They can claim that decline. Um, and if they did choose to use the USDA programs, those end in June. So July price, August price, that, that will provide them a payment. It may not be as big as potentially a conventional dairy, but there, there are, there's money there. And also if they had to do anything related to COVID, um, you know, masks or more sanitizing, whatever, any, any of those things, or if something changed, you know, the, the uh, bedding was one thing we know because, you know, Sam's on about early on closure of, of, of mills for sawdust. There, there's a price spike in there for a while. It may not be there now, but because the borders for trade is open back up, sawdust can come in. But even the plastic products, you know, the bale wrap, the silo, the uh, bunker covers, all the, that plastic comes out of China. And there were some either delays or expense there. So there's things that they can can claim that, you know, they, they have to do a little bit of work. Had the same conversation with my, my brother of, I ain't going to get anything. I'm like, well, you could get up to $34,000 if you want to take the time. If you have to spend four hours, $34,000, is that worth it to you? Wow. <laughs> so he's going to apply, I think. But that's kind of this question of people feel it's beyond hard I, I hope, I hope we're trying so hard to get that message out that there is help for you. The farm viability program, uh, you know, um, Gus Selig testified yesterday over 250 contacts. They're helping people to get this done. So this whole this this it's concerning of there's no money there for me and it's too hard. And those both are myths. They're not true. There's money there and there's help. If you feel it's too hard or you don't have the computer skills, there's help there. So I I. And, and currently, if you extend the date, great, but we have to operate under as if you're not going to. And I, and I caution, you, caution you heavily of, of how that's messaged because, oh, legislature's going to change the date. Well, it didn't happen. If it doesn't, I, I have confidence in how you get your work done. But if we have somebody contact us on October 1 and nothing's happened legislatively and like, oh, they were going to change the date. Well, they didn't. We're done. That's what the yeah. law says right now. It is September 30th. So unless it's changed legislatively, we're still moving forward <clears throat> under September 30th. Okay, Rodney, I see your hand up. Did you have an additional yeah. uh, question or comment? Yeah. Well, the problem with extending the deadline or moving the money to just to, to move the money to a different program, we still have to meet the federal deadline spending the money to and by the end of December. So you know, and it takes a while to get these applications done. No matter how I mean the dairy part of this application is pretty easy, but uh, um, you know, the rest of it's not so so easy. It's a little more confusing on what expenses can be used and what can't. Uh, but if you move, if you wait till October or something or, or November to decide you got extra money and move it to another program, there's no time to get an application done unless you've sent it in beforehand and and uh, you did that program ran out of money and then got a little extra, I guess it could be done. But. So, you know, we can't extend the deadlines for these applications out much, I don't think. Um, Rodney, Mike, Mike has his hand up. Mike, do you have a comment? No, I was just waving to my wife. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the right. so the uh, Madam Chair, the agency, um, if it were just to extend, as as uh, Representative Graham said, just to extend the deadline on existing applications, no specific changes to the application, um, we could go as far as November fifteenth to continue to accept applications. Um, our our application is is in a way backward looking of expenditures, costs that have been incurred. 
So there are, our reporting is such that the losses have already incurred, the check that is received by farmers pays past debts, so to speak. So we're confident that we could get the checks out by probably the 20th of December and then you know the expectation is already expended because it's for past harm. But that does cut it close if you're if um, the question is the money wasn't expended, we'll we'll move it to somewhere else. Those those are all a lot of moving parts to come together. If you if you are doing if you choose to do something legislatively that wholesale changes um, eligibility requirements or um, uh, now we want to pay for something else, you know. Um, I don't know what that would be, but if you wholesale change the application other than just extending what exists, that will take some time to fix the application, send it back out, all those kind of things. So it depends on what is occurring for those time time frames. So um, be very glad to interact with you all if you're if you're proposing something, changes to the application or just extending deadlines. Glad to have those conversations. Okay, I have um, a couple of hands up, um, Vicki and then John O'Brien. I just had a question, something Rodney just said in passing. He said white male owner was not eligible. What grant is that or what, what was that? I, I don't remember anything about that. I believe, uh, Vicki, that there was, uh, uh, there was a pot of money set aside for uh, women owned, um, businesses and minority owned businesses. I don't really know the details on that because we did not as a committee work on that. Um, but uh, I also know that there were other other pots of money for businesses. And I don't know if Rodney would have uh, qualified for one of those through uh, ACCD. So uh, I don't know if anybody on here, Mike or, or Diane could um, comment on that, but um, there were two pots of money that I'm aware of. Okay. The, one I was, the one I was talking about came out of Commerce Committee. But, okay. yeah, you know, I just thought it was kind of funny in today's times when we're out talking about, well, we, we got to get on our business. We'll talk about that later. Okay. Mike, did you want to say something? Uh, I think I'll pass at this point. Okay. All right. Um, so um, I think to sort of wind, you know, come, come kind of wind this back down. Um, I, you know, the original the original thought was to uh, increase recommend to appropriations that the, if, if at all possible, oh, I'm sorry, John, before I do this little thing, why don't you ask your question? Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I, Diane, I just had a couple specific dairy farmer questions. Uh, a dairy farm in Tunbridge <laughs> uh, sold their cows and stopped shipping milk sometime in April, I think. And a dairy farm in Royalton, uh, right around March, April, that the farmer retired and the people who used to milk his cows took over. And so how, how do these, uh, these grants deal with, with those sort of transitional farms? Uh, you and statute um, covered the, went out of business um, after March 1st. Um, you, um, you requested um, they needed a good faith plan to either come back into dairying or continue in other, some other form of agriculture. So there's a series of questions there of what are you doing next? Drop down menus, uh, a chance to type in other, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. What are you doing next? Um, and then they can claim the change in price back to January for March and April, and then there's no more milk to claim on and then any other economic harm. The, the thing about this application is that you can, in the other economic harm section, claim um, those changes. Um, for the farm that you just mentioned that ended shipment in April, if, um, or I think um, uh, um, the representative from Franklin County, I'm sorry, 
I'm not remembering names this morning, mentioned the dairy farmer who is, is choosing to add processing equipment. Um, those expenses and those changes to the operation can be claimed in other economic harm. So if the person going out of business in April milking cows chose to shift to vegetable production and now they need a farm stand and now they need you know, uh, boxes and they need packaging and all of those things could be claimed. It doesn't have to be dairy specific. But the real issue is, is, it, is this new enterprise going to be under the same tax identification number? Um, so if I have, a, I'm a, a sole proprietor, I use my social security number and I have five different enterprises active on my farm. I do maple, I do farm stand, I used to milk cows. Um, so I'm not doing that anymore, but now I'm doing um, lumber, but it's all under one tax ID. All of those things could be claimed in the dairy application because it's a change in the, or it's part of the business as a whole. But if I did have my dairy operation under Diane's Dairy LLC with a tax ID number and Maple was Diane's Maple LLC with a different tax ID number. The dairy application is one. I could apply for the non-dairy working lands or an ACCD grant with this whole different LLC. So these business structures become important within this and we've, we've tried to address that on our website under the FAQ. So, so it's not just in the example you gave of someone going out of business. If they're changing their agricultural operation and there's expenses associated with that. They went out of dairy because of COVID. Um, now we're pivoting to farm stand. I'm going to now do sheep. I'm going to whatever that pivot is. Some of those expenses of standing up that different enterprise can be claimed within the economic, other economic harm in our application. Uh, the example you gave of someone passing away and um, that change in ownership. Um, that one's pretty specific, and I think we're trying to work our way through that. Um, it's all, you know, it's in that case, it's all about documentation. And, and what was that relationship back in January? Because the January information is under one name. And, the you know, now the person has passed away and the, and the folks that were working there. Now I have the ownership and it's under a totally new name. We're trying to figure out the legalities of that. How does that work? I mean, that's that's a totally illegal question of, you know, it, was there any was there any documentation that said the, the folks that were milking the cows had any form of ownership or, or lease to own or any, anything that we can tie this all together with that we can document? So we're, we're looking, we're digging. We're digging hard on that one to find a way. But if someone stepped forward, you know, outside of this, someone passing away, if I wanted to start a dairy farm today and start milking cows, the eligibility goes back to actively milking cows as of March 1st. And are you actively milking cows today? So in that example, if I started today and wanted to make a claim, I was not actively milking cows in March. I'm not eligible. So that's how the, the statute is written. So, so there's some nuance, of course, and that we are looking at that situation where, you know, the owner passed away, but the folks who were doing the, the physical milking on the farm um, have now taken over. We're trying to find a way to legally make all these connections and make it happen, but uh, we have to have enough legal documentation to make our internal counsel happy and also to make sure we're not running afoul of the, the requirements of the CARES Act. So we're looking. I don't have an answer yet, but we're, we're digging. Okay. Thanks, Diane. Diane, um, if, if somebody like Rodney wanted help, um, I'm going through this myself, help, but uh, if somebody wanted help with an application, who should they contact? Um, on our website is the specific phone number, et cetera, but it's the Farm Viability Program, Mariah, okay. Mariah Noth. Um, and they have an online, of course, application as well. You can make a phone call or you can and ask for help online. And then they're assigning their service providers based on location. And I don't believe anybody's going out sitting elbow to elbow due to COVID. Um, they utilize phone, they utilize email to, to um, help people through the application. So they yeah. do have the capability mm -hmm. to, if you know, I, I'm a farmer and I have absolutely no computer, I don't do any of that, then they will, they will submit on their computer the actual application and the farmer attests the, you know, it's a very close interaction between the farmer and the service provider, but we think those are less than 10. 
So mm -hmm. that they have some form of computer, some form of access to the World Wide Web and, and um, getting this done. So uh, they, are, they are the ones helping directly. Um, in some cases, we've heard that loan officers through Yankee Farm Credit, if they're a borrower at that bank and or uh, one of the banks or financiers up in Franklin County, um, Ag Ventures is helping their clients fill out. So there's some independent outside of uh, VHCB Farm Viability, but Farm Viability is the one that's available to everyone. Okay, thanks. And then um, now I'm going to switch, um, sort of switch topic a little bit, and that is, um, if if we were to request um, that approves, if they could find more money to add to working lands, um, um, could the agency or the working lands um, board actually handle that? Um, because we know at this point uh, it's in for $594,000, which has been historically the base. We were hoping to bring it up a little bit, um, but we also know that there is now, I believe, three five million additional dollars uh, that are COVID related. So um, will those COVID re and, and those COVID related grants have to uh, meet all the requirements of the federal government, as far as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. Um, so w will those grants be tracked in the same way that um, the typical working lands grants are, or are they just, you, you get handed the money and that's it? Yeah, they are not typical, uh, Representative Partridge, they are not typical working lands grants at all. Um, it's a truncated process. Um, it's not a, they are not, they are not forward looking. The traditional working land grants are, you are planning to do what? I need a grant to help me get to this. Yeah. These current CARES Act grants are, I have had this economic harm in the past. So, or I have, I have changed my business because of COVID to do this, but they're not forward looking. So if, September 30th is, you know, on our horizon now. If we got an application that said uh, for the working lands, in November, I'm going to do this, the answer would be no. On the CARES Act money, no. The 594000 is all the typical. So the, the working lands uh, board is not involved. They were involved in setting up and having a conversation about how the funds would go out and what was eligible and what was not, but the day-to-day -day approval of those CARES Act working lands monies is not at the board. Okay. Uh, VITA is doing the first review, the agency's finalizing the second review. So the 594,000 typical process with the working lands board, um, and they were prepared if in the former budget presentation with the additional one time of 750,000, the board was prepared to manage that level of funding, 594 plus 750,000. So they are, the board is active, prepared. They're not involved in the CARES Act funding past the, the, the preliminary work on that. So yes, they would have that capacity. Okay. Michael Grady. I, I agree with almost everything that Diane said. I do think that there is some opportunity for prospective economic harm. If you can show that you're going to have, if you apply say tomorrow, but you can show you're going to have prospective economic harm three weeks from now. Um, I th still think that qualifies because the the time frame for showing economic harm is between March 1st and December 1st. So, so you have an opportunity if you can show validly and to the agencies um, that meets the agency standards that you're going to have prospective economic harm. I think that that would still qualify. That is correct, but we would be sending it back to uh, as incomplete until they could verify that they had the economic harm. So right. we're not so very, yeah, the, the, the issue being on that perspective out in the future, um, it call, the, the CARES Act, it opens, it opens us and the farmer up to audits if we go out into the future. And we've mm -hmm. tried very, very hard to avoid that of being very backward looking versus forward. So yes, if an applicant did do that and they said the harm was gonna occur 
some time within the time frame of September 30th, um, we would send that application back for verification that it did occur. And they'd have to have to document that it did occur and then yes, but reaching out into November, December with a September 30th deadline, we would deny that that line item. Okay, thank you. Um, John O'Brien has his hand up. John? Um, the, our our um, agritourism uh, community, were they eligible for um, working lands grants or, or would they mostly apply through ACCD relief? You're muted, Diane. Those are truly up to the individual. Um, it, it, we're not, the agency has been very cautious about saying, well, you should go over to this grant. This one's better. Uh -uh. Um, so the applicant needs to do some research. And that is where farm viability with their business advising could be helpful, of which is the best place for you apply. Would you get more out of ACCD than the ones at the ag level? That's, those are some individual decisions. The agency, because we're involved in the final level of review, does not want to be the one saying, you should go to this grant versus that grant, because we might be wrong. Um, so we leave that up to the applicant to make that choice and do not, the agency doesn't make those type of recommendations, but farm viability with their business advising has been involved in those discussions with applicants of where's the best place to apply. Okay, thanks. Um, Sam Lincoln, your hand is up. Thank you. Um, and I, I don't want to muddy the water on the discussion on working lands, but I just wanted to, as you're talking about the budget for that, as I, I'm the designee uh, for Commissioner Snyder on that board. Um, and when talking about the governor's recommended the 594, um, we've found uh, the past couple of years, we've been, we increased the uh, grant cap, the maximum dollar amount that a business could receive. Uh, particularly to address the low grade uh, forest product processing capacity in the state. And we, so there's a maximum grant available of $150,000 per business that can demonstrate that they are, have commitments from businesses up and down the supply chain around them. And that is, we are, we are starting to see the results of that. Uh, those larger investments with mills doubling capacity or firewood operations doubling capacity or growing and investing um, and so with 594 available there and, and you know, potentially a couple of $150,000 grants and, and there are dairy, um, dairies eligible for that too, for processing with the same type of parameter that they're going to add capacity and value in the, in the rural economy. Um, so as I, again, I don't want to, I don't want Diane's here, you know, the agency of ag, uh, it's, uh, um, the home of that, and I don't want to step on their toes, but I just want to mention that as you start talking about, you know, allocations and how to use that money and things like that, it's, there's a very important forestry component to that as well um, that, that's that been working well, so. Yeah, well, that's, that's good to hear, uh, Sam, and I think it, you know, might be one of the concerns about knocking the amount back to $594,000, although I understand that you support the governor's budget as presented. <laughs> Uh, and I want to thank the Forest Free people on here for your patience. I have um, a, a couple more things um, in a follow-up for Diane. Um, well, one's a follow-up and one is a new item, and I'm just looking for advice as to where to go with this. But um, I had an email from uh, Andrea Stander after our last meeting, and she uh, was referring to the flow chart. And Diane, you said that um, somebody is not necessarily made ineligible uh, because they had a net profit between March 1st and August 1st. And I know this is an issue for a bunch of people. And she said, if you carefully examine the uh, flow chart, um, you'll see that someone only continues to be eligible if they did, if they did have a profit, only if they have at least one W-2 employee, and this could effectively be a barrier for small sole uh, proprietor farms, uh, many of whom may have done well for a few months, but had enormous COVID expenses and continue to struggle due to the general economic downturn. So um, it, it's something, you know, I'm not quite sure how we fix that one. I don't know if the Senate is working on that. Um, 
Mike O'Grady um, in terms of, you know, what if they're going to, um, I, I don't want to use the word tinker, but, you know, make small changes to um, the uh, parameters and the requirements of the application. Um, but it's, it's something that I know is of concern. And if you're one, if you have a $1 net profit, um, is that going to kick you out? You know, when you're looking at uh, potential problems in, you know, down the road, September, October. So Mike, I don't know if the Senate. Uh, right. So S Senate Ag did discuss removing that. Um, area. Yeah. Abby Willard testified as Diane kind of supported that um, if you're going to make changes to the application, it needs to be done now because there are already um, applications coming in. Uh, the agency wants to be able to review them in a timely manner. Um, they can't kind of wait around uh, uh, for a long time um, because of some of the other conditions on the CARES Act money. So if you want to make that change, uh, you likely need to make it quickly. Okay. And, Thanks, and Representative Partridge, yes, it is yes. correct that um, moving through the flow chart um, moves people into a different funding bucket. The one that's online is, is generalized, but the H966 funds are under ACCD and they have the ACCD requirements. So those are different than S351 were and H961. So that okay. is that is why not having any employees on the W-2 is an issue. So that because of the funding stream that that pushes people into. So that is one of the areas of concern um, because the requirements of the funding that went to ACCD for working lands, 2.5 million, has different requirements than the S-351. So trying to find a way to have everybody get funding, but yes, there are times when the, you, you can't be, you can't have zero W-2 employees and get the ACCD funding. Okay. I believe, and that may be changing. So, yep. you know, yep. there's, there's changes going on afoot in the ACCD world, but that is why, yes, that is true. If the, if, if you are shuffled off that branch of the, of the flow diagram, it is possible to become ineligible. That is true. Okay. So I would, so the recommendation would probably be for anybody who's interested in applying to contact the farm viability program go on your website, look for those con those links and contacts and to connect with, uh, with those folks because they're going to be helping. Yeah. And I think one other item on the uh, changing the application, um, we, we, uh, we built these applications based on a scope of work and the funding to build all these applications went through the CARES Act through ADS who pays the, the um, software company. If there are going to be changes that are outside of our scope of work, there's no more money at ADS, the agency's budget would have to pick that up. So I, you know, if you're going to start throwing, well, if we change this, do you have to pay for it? We would have to go back to the software company and say, this is what needs to be changed. Is it still within our scope of work or is it outside of that? And are we going to have to pay? The other aspect around changing the application, yes, soon, please do it soon. But if something is happening with Sam's forestry application or an ACC application or all these other things that are occurring, occurring, we're put in line of when we get our application done. So you could say, oh, did it today, Diane, go change that application. The software company may come back and say, oh, we got five other people in front of you. You're going to wait until we can get to yours. So there's a lot of moving parts here and it's not just a simple, oh, you know, House and Senate Ag agreed, the full Senate agreed, the full House agreed, it's done. Then there may be, you know, a series of weeks before we can get our application changed because the same thing happened to Sam, same thing happened to ACC. So we may be put in line and it's not an immediate fix, depending on the extent of it, you know, extending a deadline, yep, changing a cap, probably not a problem, but when you start digging into this 
if you look at this flow chart, the logic and the questions to move through that flow chart, pulling out one peg is like pulling out a, a stick in that, that game where it all collapses. So it's, it's, we would have to go back to the software provider and have those questions of how long it will take to fix. And I think one other thing to consider is that there are a little over 100 people in process of an application for the non-dairy working lands right now. If you choose to make a change and we start awarding money, if, if the initial award were the, the, the House bills, the maximum is 50,000. Senate bill, the maximum is 20. If they went through this process and got the $50,000 and you changed the parameters and they really only now should have got 20, do we have to go back and get the 30,000 back from the farmer? So that's kind of a question of the overall fairness of what this happens to the ones that are in process right now, or do we have to stop? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of this question, because right now we know the deadline is the 30th and we're, mo we're working toward that deadline, nothing has changed. But if we get into this, you know, we're, we're gonna start approving applications that are ready next week and, and writing checks for the non-dairy working lands. And so if something occurs in the legislature that changes that and we've paid somebody too much, do we have to go back and get the money back? I mean, these are the fairness and equity kind of questions of, oh, I shouldn't have applied first, but it was first come first serve. And so just keep that in your mind as you think about these changes of how does this work overall uh, for those who may have jumped in and applied right away versus those that may be waiting. So yeah. I'm not predicting gloom and doom. I'm just wanting to think all of it through before you make a change. Right, and again, you know, I know that we actually dumped quite a, quite a task or three or four in your laps, and we really appreciate the hard work you've all, you've all done to make it to make it happen. So, um, I guess my last my last question has to do with, um, and I, and I'm just really looking for guidance. Um, I had an email from uh, Betsy Rosenbluth regarding the FY21 Farm to School budget. Uh, and she said, we know that we need $500,000 annually in the farm to school and early education program. We also know this is a most difficult year and that it'll, it will take quite a while to recover from the pandemic. For the FY21 budget, we are asking you to support the governor's request for funding for farm to school to keep the program going. This is $50,000 less than the program had the last several years. We are also asking that you please consider adding an additional $100,000 to the Farm to School Grant Program from the Coronavirus Relief Fund, funding for equipment and supplies for schools and early childhood programs to respond to the demands placed on them from the pandemic. This would include equipment, materials, and supplies for school nutrition programs and classrooms, including improvements for outdoor learning spaces equipment for processing, packaging, storing, and serving meals safely. For instance, meal car carts or vacuum sealers, learning kits for remote classes, et cetera. So any advice uh, regarding that? Is that um, uh, a request we might put into our message to a probe or how, how might that work? So our base funding for um, the farm to school, uh, farm to school and universal meals were combined in our budget. So 171,875. There's been no change to that. Uh, the, the reference they're making of $50,000 less is one-time funding. So mm -hmm. they, they count that one-time funding as if the agency cut it and we did not. So we are level funded and the general fund for um, universal meals, food, to farm to school. So we have 171,875. Uh, the potential of, of CARES Act funds, uh, we'd have to make the determination eligibility or not of what they're requesting. Uh, I don't, first blush, don't specifically see any issues. It would be standing up another program for them and the timing issues come into play. Can they expend these, can schools expend these funds, can we get them out the door? Can we expend them in a timely manner prior to the end of the calendar year? So that potential is there. Um, if it's CARES Act funds, um, and then within the agencies or the state's budget um, funding for that, um, there's always, it's always a very important program and, and would leave that up to you as legislators of the support for that. 
program or not. Okay. Okay. So it would be maybe our recommendation going to the appropriations committee. Sure. Okay. That that would be one way. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think okay. um, over um, in your uh, the budget meeting earlier this week, I, I had my uh, my technical difficulties with my computer quitting. Um, so the uh, the question at that point was the two plus two program, and I have provided you that information for uh, FY21. Uh, if all students continue enrollment, uh, it looks we will be short about fifty one thousand uh, to be able to cover all the scholarships. Um, the the plan, the expectation is full enrollment, uh, five seniors, five juniors, five sophomores, and five um, freshmen. Um, unknown currently about the COVID impact and it, you know, our kids going to continue to be enrolled or not, but that is the expectation, full enrollment and uh, 51,000 short. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Um, um, so what if everybody enrolls and we're $51,000 short? What happens then? Uh, we would reduce scholarship amount across the board. Okay. Equally right. between all students. Okay. All right. Thanks. But we'd want to communicate that fairly soon. Yes. Right. Right. All right. So that's all I have for you, Diane. I'm wondering if the committee members have any additional questions for Diane at this point, or shall we move on to forestry? Madam, Madam Chair, there was one more item that has been brought up, I know, by uh, Vermont Housing Conservation Board. The 75000 okay. that was for their grant writer to assist towns and, and uh, individuals to apply for grants, that it was one-time funding, even though it's been one time over a course of several years, that is not in our current budget, and that was 75000 So that is not in our budget at this point because it was one-time funding. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Um, Vicki had her hand up. Vicki, do you still have your hand up? I, I just quickly wanted to ask Diane, what, where did that 51,000 shortfall happen or why? Was it COVID somehow? What happened there? No, it's not COVID. It is, uh, we've been working for years to get to full enrollment. Um, last year, we were off by one. We had uh, 19 students out of a possible 20. This year, we have all 20 um, and the potential tuition increase. Our base funding for the 2 plus 2 program is 170,000. Um, 170000 uh, and $222. We've had some carry forward in past years. Um, the expected tuition for all 20 students would be 241000 We have 20000 in carry forward, which would make us $190,337. And we have a um, expected bill of 241000 So it's just the full enrollment with all the students and the continued increase in tuition. So our base funding is not keeping pace with the growth in tuition. Um, in the past, we had a lot of carry forward because we didn't have full enrollment, uh, but now it is catching up to us. So the overall program now for two plus two with full enrollment is is really getting close to $250,000 and our base is 170. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks, do you, have, do you have that memorized or is that written in front of you? <laughs> You can't see me pull up different spreadsheets. So this is what it's like to sit in front of you all in committee and you're all looking at your computer and we're sitting there with no computer and testifying. So now the, the tables are turned. I can look at my computer screen and testify at the same time. This is, this is nice turnaround. It, it looks really, it looks like you're just memorizing all that. No. Well, I'm glad to know that your computer is potentially working again, Diane. Yes, I'm back in business. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Um, so Sharon Fagard has her hand up. And Sharon, I'm going to let you ask a question. And then I think we need to cut this off and move to our forestry portion. So um, Sharon, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Diane, is that is that um, position that's cut, um, is that going to impair the ability to help applicants with the grants that are coming through on on CARES money, is that, has that position kind of folded in to help support all the grants that are coming through for the federal funds? Uh, what position are you referring to? The one you just said was was cut, that $75,000. Oh, oh, okay. That is not a, that's not a position. That's a pass-through of funds from oh. the state to 
um, the Farm Viability Program. They provide the services. Uh, we are the pass-through entity from right, state so, to get the money out to VHCB. Okay, and is the services that they're providing, that's, I think, I thought you said that that was a, a position there. I believe it may be a position at Farm Viability. I'd have to go determine that 100%, but okay. that is the work that they're doing specifically with towns to access all the federal grants. Uh, they've been very successful. I would encourage you to have um, Gus Seelig in or, or someone from the Farm Viability Program. It's been a very successful program, but because it is one-time funds and has been since the start, uh, people seem surprised that it's not in our agency budget. But when you folks at the legislature give us one-time funds, it's one time. It does not go on to our base budget. I, I guess my, my, my concern is if these funds are helping keep up with um, applications for the CARES Act money, I, I would hate nope, to. That's not the, that's not the use oh. of those funds. Okay. That is not the use of those funds. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, everybody. I'm going to, um, I think that we need to move on to the forestry portion. Diane, I really thank you for your, um, a presence here today and for all your um, your your brain trust of answers <laughs> um, and um, and you're welcome to hang on or you're welcome to uh, head out as well so it's up to I'm, you I'm uh, I'm hoping to go in and, uh, and approve for payment several uh, dairy applications so I will um, I will exit but thank you very all much right. for having me this morning thanks for all your hard work all right um, Folks, let's turn to the forestry budget. Uh, we uh, had heard some um, some points about um, some money. Maida had some questions. Um, thank you, Maida, so much for joining us today uh, on our Zoom call. Um, and so I'm going to turn this over to Commissioner Snyder, and he can talk to us a little bit about that. And then maybe say a few words or, or delegate somebody else to say a few words about the, uh, the COVID related, the coronavirus related uh, relief package and how that's going for foresters, uh, loggers, et cetera. Great. Thanks, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. I uh, also have along here Deputy Sam Lincoln and our financial manager, Kristen Freeman. Um, so uh, please welcome them as well. It's good to see you all. Hope you all had a good, uh, enjoy, got to enjoy some, some good Vermont summer here in the interim. Uh, and Madam Chair, so uh, my expectation here from you is that you would, again, like to hear a little bit about the budget and the grant, pro, the forest economy stabilization grants. Given that you've just been kind of in the grant mode, do you want to start with that and then we'll switch to the budget? Um, what's your preference? We're prepared sure, to do it e all. Either way, I don't know if Meta has some uh, time constraints. Um, I know she had questions about, I think it was $71,000. So uh, I want to make sure her questions get answered. Maybe she's already gotten them answered, but it would be helpful for us to know too. Meta, did you want to say something? Just, sure. just whatever you want to do, Madam Chair, is fine by me. My chair has given me the wherewithal to be here for as long as you would like and as long as I need. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you. so much. All right, Michael, you can go ahead and do whatever, you know, however you'd like to do this, set this up. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, Representative Townsend. And, um, and I just alert you, I, I'm having difficulties apparently. I've never experienced this before with my setup, but I'm having sort of connectivity issues. So I have turned off my video. Uh, if that's a problem for you, you don't, you know, uh, let me know, but it seems to be helping the audio to just go with uh, audio. So uh, given that Deputy Lincoln has, uh, has to be elsewhere, I would then uh, suggest we start with this, these forced economy stabilization grants. And I would, um, uh, you know, because I'd like to have Sam uh, run you through that. He's prepared to do so. And I just simply want to introduce it by saying um, this has been really important. We're really grateful for the sector specific assistance, the $5 million to stand up a program. And that Sam deserves an enormous amount of credit. This has been incredibly difficult, complex. He will be the first to tell you it's a team. And it is. And we've had a lot of help. 
but he's really done an incredible job with a complex project. And um, so I'm going to shut up and let him tell you what's going on and how it's gone. Sam, you ready to go? Thank you. I am. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Sam Lincoln, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, for the record. Um, uh, so the Vermont Forest Economy Stabilization Grant, uh, we, we all talked, I think we gave you a, a few reports in June about the situation in the forest economy and we've since stood up a program and I'll, I'll give you a, a quick history about why and, and, and where we're at with, with applications and, and some changes we've made since uh, um, the bill passed or, or uh, you know, some adjustments we've made as we've moved along and implemented the program. Um, so when the pandemic hit, um, the forest economy was designated as essential. Many, most uh, businesses in the forest economy were designated as essential because of their, um, their production of uh, paper goods, medical supplies um, uh, for use in hospitals, um, tissue paper, food packaging, takeout packaging, uh, home and business heating, fuel, electrical power for the grid, uh, sawdust for dairy farms. There was an enormous demand on those businesses, and and as shifts happened throughout the national, <clears throat> excuse me, and global economy, um, it was clear that those businesses needed to operate to to keep goods and services flowing to uh, the public. Um, with that, though, there came um, the shutdown of many offices, schools, homes, businesses. Uh, people started using far less paper, and um, that that continues today. And we've seen the shutdown of, of uh, major paper mills in the region that produce a lot of the, the, the forests here are uh, well suited to produce wood that is used in printing paper, white paper that you all have in those boxes and next to your printers. And, um, we have warehouses at paper mills full of millions of tons of paper um, in the region. Um, we have paper mills in the region that still have wood stacked up that they bought last winter that they have not used. Um, they are eking along, trying to keep their people employed, trying to keep the supply chain that supplies them employed. Um, we've also seen um, some incredibly strong demand on other parts of the forest economy, anything to do with home gardening. There's been a boom in these uh, victory gardens, if you will, lumber at small sawmills to build raised beds. There's been um, anything to do with tool handles, which is actually eating a lot of ash logs that the, the True Temper mill in the region uh, produces for, for Ames True Temper. They make tool handles. Um, people staying at home doing home improvement projects with extra unemployment money in their in their paychecks and things like that have, have spent a lot of money on uh, home improvements. And, um, and as the uh, Canadian economy and the border was shut down and things like that, we've also seen a huge, there was a shutdown of the supply chain. And now we're seeing sometimes up to a two month de delay in things like pressure treated lumber um, and the, the, the local supply or the, the, the supply chain can't, it hasn't, hasn't caught back up yet. So we're seeing a real whiplash in certain places and uh, a lot of firewood demand um, as well as people see burning wood uh, as energy security. And they either stayed home and burned up all their wood pile last spring while they were home and bought their wood again for next winter, not knowing what the circumstances would be. And that, that's still occurring. We're still seeing very strong demand there. So um, in all that, the supply chain experienced, uh, even though they were designated essential, there was a, a real loss of revenue and business uh, as this all occurred. Um, the program was set up um, by uh, Act 180, 138, uh, S-351, and businesses were, we, uh, we, we set up the program that businesses that had experienced could demonstrate revenue loss um, of between $5,000 and $100,000 in certain categories in the supply chain um, were eligible for uh revenue loss compensation, direct reimbursement. Um, a few things that we did a little differently than some of the other programs is that um, we did, uh, we learned that um, doing, mirroring what ACCD has done wasn't necessarily gonna work for our program, which was how we thought we would set it up for simplicity and consistency. Um, but we did a, a five month window of revenue loss comparison from March through July of this year to last year. And if the business experienced $5,000 or more in revenue loss, uh, up to $100,000, they could receive that direct reimbursement. The, the issue with doing 
for us with doing 10% of 2019 revenues, which some of these other programs do, is that that doesn't correlate uh, directly to what they may have lost. And that, that it, and as uh, uh, Diane Bothfeld recently said in her testimony, uh, there's this concern that we've learned a lot about of going back and having to audit businesses and possibly claw back money. If they didn't experience revenue loss greater than the grant they got, we would have to go go back and and bring, try and claw those funds back. Um, so we did a dollar for dollar. If they demonstrated revenue loss for a certain time period, we did not look forward at all because of the concern if they if they have a turnaround in quarter four that we did not want to have to go back and um, uh, potentially ask for that money back from those businesses. So if they've demonstrated revenue loss, they're they've eligible they're eligible for those past months. Uh, just to give you some quick statistics on where we're at, uh, we have had um, right now we have 60 applications that have been submitted and, and are reviewed and re <clears throat> recommended for approval and pending payment. In those 60 applications, there's $3.1 million um, of economic harm. Um, uh, applications that were submitted and still under review is another uh, half a million dollars. Um, by type, we've had 32 logging contractors, 24 wood manufacturers or crafters, those are furniture and um, other types of businesses, um, seven wood processors, which are sawmills and fuel wood producers, and eight trucking enterprises um, and two uh, consulting forestry businesses. The, uh, those have come from 13 of the 14 counties in the state. The average uh, eligible grant size is $49,125 for our applicants. Average number of employees per business is six and the average annual gross sales of those applicants is $1,023,867. Um, so those businesses are, um, we, we've, we see a, a wide range, everything from the sole proprietor. We also, we made sole proprietors eligible, uh, which was critical to the small family businesses in the rural economy. Um, and we also are seeing, you know, businesses with up to 60, 70, 80 employees um, applying as well. Um, I think the average, when I ran the averages um, yesterday, we're looking at uh, the average grant is about 5% of the gross sales of these businesses. So it's helpful to many of them, um, you know, that have high capital payments, they have uh, large expenses to run these businesses when particularly if they're idled, even for one month, it can really snowball quickly. Um, and so this, this uh, amount has, I think, um, uh, going to be very helpful for them, but the situation essentially is ongoing, you know, the application eligibility date ended on July 31st, we're processing applications until September 4th um, to give people plenty of time to apply, get their book work in order and things like that. Um, but this is an ongoing situation for sure. Um, we have heard, we've, we've uh, as, as the agency of ag, the Farm and Forest Viability Program has been a great helpful partner um, with technical service providers. We have people that are, are great business operators. They know the right way to get trees marked or harvested or trucked to a mill or milled or manufactured, but they're not necessarily experts in financial statements. And so the Fire and Forest Viability Program has been helpful with that. Um, we've had a technical assistance line uh, at the department and, and we're helping, we've been able to quickly um, get people right through the system. Anybody who's had any issues has been uh, helped and um, we've been able to make it work. The one I think also, um, you know, looking forward at the rest, the rest of this calendar year and in, in consideration of your work looking ahead um, is that, again, it's a, this is an evolving situation with, these, with, the, with the loss of the paper mills and, and demand suppressed for that wood. It's, uh, I think, I don't know where all the relief funding will go, but there's certainly going to be an ongoing need until businesses and schools, institutions, government buildings reopen and are using paper at the rate that they were before. But I suspect it's a, this is a long-term change uh, with, with people realizing that they can work from home electronically without pressing print on various things. Um, but the world is also has strong demand for renewable paper products, packaging products and things like that. So it's got time to, it's gonna have to have time to sort itself out. Um, but we are, we are um, I think I said the same thing the last time we were here, we're at a 
point of real vulnerability in the forests of Vermont and the forest economy supply chain with a handful of paper mills um, buying um, about 16% of the annual harvest from the state and uh, that are, are operated by global globally owned uh, companies and things which in some respects provide strength and um, uh, strong markets and things like that. But at other times, you know, one of those mills, one decision by a corporate board of directors to uh, re reduce production at a mill or close a mill um, is having a major impact on the Vermont <laughs> forest economy supply chain. And so the investments, as we were talking about, like with working lands, we've heard from a number of past recipients of those funds that are growing their mills, their sustainability of their operation, the process would, um, creating more markets back home here in Vermont. And um, we're hearing from people now that the, the relief funds, the CARES Act money is not really meant for project-based things in terms of the grants to the private sector. It's, it's more based on lost revenue. But we're hearing from people that have projects. They want to expand and grow businesses. They see opportunity and there's, they, they, we need to. We need to grow the capacity to use uh, this low-grade wood in state. Um, and particularly for right now, the demand is on the energy side. So Sam, could I interrupt you just very briefly? And this is a really fantastic report, but what I hear you saying is that there's potentially a, a need for larger infrastructure investment. And that if, you know, and I don't know how much it's cost to set up a, a sawmill, but um, it seems like if we're gonna be cutting back the working lands grant money to $594,000 that, you know, the $100,000, $150,000 grants to, to make an investment in something like a sawmill um, would probably be difficult. That's correct. Yeah, okay. So we can file that little tidbit away. All right, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, but I actually, when you were giving um, a list of the folks who had applied, you, I, I was busy writing and you said seven processors, eight truckers, two foresters, and then who, what were the other categories? Uh, 32 logging contractors. Okay. Um, 24 wood manufacturers and crafters. Okay, great. And so, Thanks. yeah, in, in, in that, uh, in that group, uh, if I could go back to that, again, yes. we found businesses that, um, that they were designated as essential and they, f they found a way, you know, some of them with five, 10, 20 employees, they found a way to move forward and, and be creative and innovative about how they did things. And, uh, there's one business in particular that I can think of that they, they, actually gained in revenue, but they did it at cutting profits and renting new machinery to do new work and take on new jobs. So their revenue grew, but their profit was down significantly. Um, and so they were ineligible for our program. Um, you know, and we've had a few other experiences where, again, businesses that are, their diversity was adversity in this application. We, we made it so that they were, uh, they needed to be 50% or more forced products business uh, revenue in 2019, which is you know, what we interpreted the statute to be. Um, and there are people that have other businesses that may have had more than 50% of their revenue from a side enter an excavating enterprise or something else that they, that they did in 2019 that made them ineligible. Um, we have some large well-known uh, wood manufacturers in the state that are not based, that are not uh, uh, located in the state of Vermont that uh, made them ineligible. You know their headquarters is out of state and things like that. So, so we've done some good work, and we feel very good that we've been able to process these applications quickly. The payments are going to go out within two weeks, um, and uh, but there's 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 people we didn't catch. There's businesses that we did not are not able to help. And again, particularly we're thinking of those ones that that have a lot of strength in their management capability and innovativeness, innovation, in, and um, that. Um, were just under the wire and, and we weren't able to help. So, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot of that, but we're it certainly happened in the forest economy and um, people are, there's lots of, lots of new things going on. People uh, doing new service work for landowners and things, but um, it's gotta be profitable for these people to sustain these major investments that they have. So, so um, Sam, Mike, is there, 
Go ahead. Sam, um, I, I see two hands up, but um, I, I just want to clarify. It sounds to me like you have, um, um, there have been, um, and in terms of money, um, $3.6 million in applications, 3.1 has gone out and um, a half a million is still under review. Um, do you see a way to, uh, I mean, Diane pointed out the problem of tweaking the language other than uh, a date change or something like that. Um, do you see some small tweaks that could be made to maybe bring some of those folks in who were um, uh, industrious and as, as Vermonters are found a way to make, uh, make ends meet or make do and keep people busy and all of that sort of thing? Um, do you see a way to do that? Um, I think it's possible. Um, and probably the, the, and, and as Diane alluded to, there's an enormous amount of backend work that goes on with the software developers that, that they make it look so easy on the, on the application side, but there's an enormous amount of work into each one of those things. But if anything, I think, um, that we could take away possibly just remove some questions and, and maybe the logic wouldn't be affected too much, but I'd have to talk, I guess we'd have to find out if any of the changes we made were compliant with the federal eligibility standards and then what the impact would be on the, um, on the uh, uh, software and application logic and things like that. The, um, the other piece of that is our program, the grants, uh, the, the funding that we have reverts back to the Agency of Commerce on September 15th, which is 17, 18 days away. Right. Um, and so we're on trajectory to sp spend as much of this as we can on forest economy businesses by then. And, and uh, um, I don't know if I, I, get, we, I, I guess we'd have to figure that out and get back to you, understand what uh, what changes we think we could make that would do that and whether or not those people could get their applications in in time. And if we change, you know, move the date, uh, there's a number of things to be figured out there. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think speed is of the essence here. As Diane said, anything we do, we have to do quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not quite sure what, uh, what form that would take, whether it would be in the appropriations bill, whether it would be something that we tag on to um, whatever the Senate is working on. Um, so, and, and I'm, yeah, it's, it's complicated, but I think that uh, it has to move quickly if we're going to do it. We can, we can, uh, um, what's is today Friday already? Um, I think we could yeah. uh, have at least conceptually um, something organized by the, by early next week. I don't think that okay. would be cool for us. So, our recommendations have to go out to uh, approves by the end of business on Wednesday because they want to they want to do the final work on Friday and I don't want to uh, bollocks them up. So, um, at any rate, we can be in touch about that. Um, uh, John O'Brien's hand up is up, and then Rodney's is up. So, John, you want to go ahead? Thank oh. you. Um, this this may. Um be going down a rabbit hole, but I remember either in an all house caucus or an email thread, um, Kitty Toll and a couple other representatives uh, talking about how uh, the, the window to apply for the forestry CRF funds um, came during a period when when loggers weren't doing much business, uh, you know, mud season sort of end of winter, I think. And so a lot of them felt that it, it was just sort of badly timed or they they you know wish it was at another you know maybe a longer period when they started up again was there was there anything to that or so so 20 two two, two issues is you know mud season during march april early may is typically a time when depending on where in the state they are and the soil types are working on the operations are shut down so the revenue loss um may not have been uh, experience during that time, uh, which they would, uh, you know, see in the in the future months if that if those five months were moved a little bit around the calendar, if you will. Um, 
Uh, the other thing was that 2019, it was extremely wet in April, May, and June of 2019. So many logging operations, there's actually logging operations that are showing positive revenue in a, in a revenue comparison with 2019, mm -hmm. even though they've experienced a, 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 a really bad months in 2020, it was better than what they had, they dealt with in the weather of 2019. And um, so they're sort of throwing their hands up in frustration uh, uh, because they're, they're just having two piggyback years of really bad uh, five to six months of the year. So that, that was something that we had talked about um, is uh, it was a concern, but at the same time, um, uh, we haven't heard from an, um, a huge number of applicants that that was an issue for, but we don't know who we haven't heard from, who saw it and, and said, this isn't going to work for me. Um, but I think what we, the thing that we, um, you know, opening again, as the situation has been evolving and getting worse for some businesses is the month, you know, we did March through July, um, because August, nobody had, when we opened our applications, it was the 5th of August and no one had experienced revenue loss in August yet. And we didn't know if the funds would be expended quickly. So we can open, you know, we can potentially open back up add August in for new applicants um, that they could apply. There's one, one possibility that we could do um, so that it gives them a little more of their typical operating season in which they would be eligible for. But again, without a date change to extend the deadline or things like that, we'd be looking at four days. They'd have four days to get their uh, their books in order for August, particularly for accrual businesses that need to get get um, their books finalized for the month and things like that. The, uh, the, the you know, that could be tricky, but we could certainly, again, with a date, let's say a date change uh, uh, could make something like that work, so. Great, thanks, Sam. Okay, uh, Rodney has his hand up, and then John Bartholomew. So, well, Rodney, why don't you go ahead? Uh, <clears> a <throat> quick, a, a, a little different subject. Sam, thank you for you've got a guy coming to look at that tree this morning. So, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. That's it. That was quick. <laughs> that was easy. All right, John Bartholomew, go ahead. Um. I've actually been hearing a lot about the availability of pressure treated lumber and you had mentioned that. I'm curious if, is that um, related to everyone's home? So they're doing home projects and there are more people using it or is it some kind of a disruption in the supply chain? And when do we think it might uh, be more normal? Well, I'm hearing about this more, um, let's say outside my FPR life from my friends who are contractors and builders or people doing home improvement projects that they're looking at up to eight weeks before they can get pressure treated lumber delivered. Um, so I think it's a combination of the two situations you asked about is that there's, there's demand because it seems to be a lot of home renovation and construction going on uh, anecdotally. I don't have those numbers, uh, how that works in the state. Um, but, and, and then the supply chain is, is generally what we're hearing is the supply chain got emptied out as mills, particularly the Canadian mills were not designated as essential in, immediately. And so that created a real um, break in the supply chain overall of lumber available in the country. And as things restarted, it just took time to get, it's taking time. It hasn't, it hasn't been accomplished yet, but to refill the supply chain. And we're still hearing about nationally about tissue paper issues and things like that, that are, that are still, everything is still very much a just in time delivery. Um, and paper tissue is very bulky and they don't the companies, corporations don't want to build big warehouses to store uh, those kind of things. So it's all very much made and delivered on demand. And when there's a run on a product, they, they, they get used up very quickly. Good. All right, Rodney, your hand is still up. Um, did you have another question or did you just not lower it? Just didn't lower. Um, okay. I might, one, one correction I wanted to offer the chair um, on the numbers that, that you, you had the numbers um, uh, that I, I, I want to just make sure I clarify the numbers. So we, right now we have recommended for approval a th little over 3.1 million yep. under you five, uh, a little over 500,000. Okay. Um, and, and so combined total, that's the 3.6. 
Um, right. So those are applications that are either, like I said, recommended for approval or they're in the system and we're working out problems uh, with documentation or things like that. There's another, about another, uh, there's 54 in the system that have registered, started applications, but have not pushed the button and, and fully submitted them yet. Uh, okay, so maybe your whole 1.4 million could be the, you know, the additional 1.4 million could be, well, maybe not completely, I'm not going to do math on the fly here, but um, you might be approaching your $5 million cap, right? Well, in Vita, you know, the Vita fees, Vita has been a, I never, I didn't mention them. They've done all the reviews for us um, and their yes. fees are going to come out of that. Um, and we're, be cautious to make sure we don't overspend. And we're, we're looking at that um, $5 million as though as if FIDA was going to expend all of the, everything they were eligible for, just, just to make sure we don't run into some situation where we've approved and notified grantees that they're going to get a grant and then we find out that we don't have any money. So, so we're sort of holding that in reserve. Um, and, uh, and that was a source of um, concern. As I recall, Vita was asking for 10% uh, for fees and what do we settle on five or seven? Five to eight, I believe is what it is. Um, okay. we're still working with Vita on that. They've again, been a, an enormous, uh, um, help to us in, uh, setting this up and in implementing it. And we're still working that out, um, cause they're doing okay. the for all the other programs too. So we're getting that finished as quickly as we can. Um, okay. One other important thing that I did not mention that I think is really important uh, in all this is is the um, some of these businesses. Um, there are a handful of businesses in our applications that are uh, wood manufacturers that originally did not think they were going to be eligible for our program, and they applied with ACCD, and they maxed out uh, their fifty percent or fifty thousand dollar ACCD grant uh, with ACCD. Um, but when they, they demonstrated, some of them demonstrated many hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue loss and, and they, they meet our eligibility standards. And the way that that's been handled is that um, they can apply for a forestry grant. And if they're, let's say they're eligible, they've showed $120,000 in eligible, uh, uh, revenue loss. And so that means they're eligible for a $100,000 forestry grant we're deducting that 50,000 they already got from ACCD out of that. So there's no duplication. You know, we, we learned that when, when we all were meeting in this, in this early in June and talking about this, the double dipping concept came up, uh, it was talked about a lot. And, and there's a difference between double dipping and duplicate duplicated uh, compensation. And so we have made sure that they, they may be applying it and being awarded from two programs, but they're demonstrating that they've experienced that, that dollar for dollar uh, revenue loss to the business. So we have a handful of uh, wood manufacturers that fell into that category. Um, and uh, uh, we're, that's how we're handling it. We're documenting those carefully. Um, and uh, okay. so. Great, Sam, thanks. Thank you all. All right. Um, now, uh, John, uh, John has his actual hand up, John. Oh, just a quick follow up on what you were asking about, Carolyn, was um, we heard yesterday from a that AAFM is going to get uh, to stand up their granting programs, you know, 1.3 to 1.5 million. And I was wondering if there was any sort of backfill from the CARES funds for FPR along those lines. Is that, is that a question for me, Representative O'Brien? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I guess I'm. Yeah. and I'm not. I'm not sure what you mean by that. There's they're getting that money to stand those programs up. Do you mean for their budget for for, for staff time or? Right. Exactly. Um, I don't know. I'm going to turn to the commissioner and ask if he knows the answer to that. Um, or, I'm, or, I may be missing something, but not to my knowledge. Uh, that that's a nice idea. Um, I'm interested, but. It, we, uh, I know of no such uh, back funding to support our standing up of this stuff. It's, we're just doing it. So okay. that, that's an interesting point, John. Um, so not, you know, uh, the, the, in particular, the ag development folks have been spending many of their hours um, on, on getting these uh, programs up and running. And they, 
are able to basically save money in terms of their general fund costs. They're meeting, they're meeting their um, required uh, um, cut to the budget by backfilling basically with COVID money uh, because the staff is spending so much time standing up these COVID related programs. Well, we certainly have the latter staff, Sam leading it, but other staff as well, a significant amount of time this summer has been spent in doing that, standing up the program. So we have that and can document that, but our understanding has been this money's ineligible. It's not uh, our, our salaries and our costs for, you know, operating things that are already in our budget. That's not eligible for this funding. So that's a big surprise to me. And if I've missed a chance, Man, that's really important. And I'm glad that Representative Townsend may be hearing this, that uh, if there's a way, we need to look at that because that's, our, that's not our understanding at all. Uh, and these folks have just dropped everything um, to some extent and had to just add this to, to an existing portfolio of important priority work. So this has been a massive undertaking and we're just covering it, uh, just, just eating it. Um, so um, maybe you want how much how much were you asked to cut from your budget uh well we have a, a three percent general fund target now I'll, I'll walk you through that here in a moment but that's that's the general um uh you know that's the general fund target in the restatement that i'm about to explain to you and what it looks like in our budget and our operations okay carolyn did we ever find out what the source of of those CARES funds for AAFM was for the backfill? I, I don't know um, off the top of my head, no. So, uh, you know, and, and uh, Michael Snyder, you could potentially check with Diane Bothfeld about all of this as well. We'll follow up for sure. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks Representative O'Brien for even, even noticing it. Uh, Again, I, I'd really like to know what's 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 up with this, and if it's possible, because um, that would be significant. Yeah, I I think actually on our web page, I'm not going to be able to find it now on the fly, but on our web page is the uh, from Wednesday is the agriculture AAFM's um, presentation to us, and that was included. So you might take a look at that. Sam, did you did you did you want to say something? Did you know anything else? No, I'm all, all I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to just say Vicky has her hand up, and I'd like to let Vicky go ahead, and then maybe Michael, you can um, proceed with what sure. you wanted to say. I just had a brief thought and a question, Carolyn, um, and maybe for Linda Lehman, for our newest member on the committee. Sometimes when you come on a committee and you hear all these acronyms, you're like, "What? What? What was that one?" Um, I'm sure our new representative is, is well aware of numerous uh, entities, but there's even a few I had to stop and go, wait, what was that again? Um, I just wondered if Linda could email us. I know we were given a sheet of acronyms, but um, <laughs> I just wondered if, if that would be available and for review and for our newest member. That's a great idea, Vicki, and I don't know if Cynthia has anything she wants to say about it. She has been in the in the house for a long, long time, and she has served mm -hmm. on a number of committees, so she probably has a pretty good idea of what they are, but that's a really good point. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so um, if, if you do look on our website, Wednesday, August 26th, uh, Diane Bothfeld's um, FY21 budget request second time uh, uh, presentation is there. And you will see, I think it's on the fourth slide, um, 1.5, a little bit more, but $1.5 million use of CARES Act funding. Um, the agency has documented $1.5 million in CARES Act funding needs at the agency of ag. These funds will be used to offset general fund expenditures across four of the six appropriations at the agency. Funds will be specifically used for PPE, offset for COVID related leave, employee time dedicated to the administration, implementation and financial review and maintenance of the COVID agricultural assistance programs. Wow. 
the earlier parts make sense, um, but that last one, that's a game changer. And it's news well, to me. You uh, might want to take a look at that. Certainly will, Madam Chair, thanks. Yeah. I don't know, it, perhaps Michael Grady might know anything about this. Mike, do you have anything no. to add? No, I don't, frankly. Is Sorry. it a surprise to you as well, Mike? Does it sound? Uh, could, Carolyn, could you could you repeat that last that last line that last item? Sure. Funds will be specifically used for PPE, offset for COVID related leave, employee time dedicated to the administration, implementation, and financial review and maintenance of the COVID agricultural assistance programs. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that. Um, where, where are you getting that from? This is on the uh, presentation that Diane made on Wednesday, and it's on our website. It's the FY21 budget request, and I think it's under, uh, let me just go back and see if I can find the exact. Oh, it's the 1.5 million. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so I, I do know what that is. They're, they're basically um, uh, all the additional uh, time and all the additional equipment that the agency is expending uh, in response to the pandemic um, does qualify for, for potentially qualifies for CARES Act funding. And so that, that's, what, that's what they're budgeting. I just, uh, the way that it's summarized there is, is a little confusing. <laughs> wow. Anyway, you are, what was in, 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 intimated to us was that, uh, you know, those, those are not eligible costs. Uh, the, there is an allowance for like the develop, the, the Salesforce application development, the software the, uh, that that's eligible but like staff time and um, a PPE and all that, that's one thing, but you know, your art, there, there's been no offset presented as eligible for our time in responding. So I will indeed look into it. Um, I hope, I hope I, we just were wrong and that uh, maybe we can find a way. Um, that's significant. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank Good. you. Sure. Did you want to go ahead, Michael? I, I sure can if you guys are set with Sam and the, the grant program uh, update. Yes. Uh, so I, thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, you know, pivot to our restatement of the governor's recommend for uh, FY21. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to give you every last bit of detail. Uh, as, as Representative Townsend knows, we do that in, in a probes, but, uh, you know, what what's, I think it would be helpful, Madam Chair, just to have a sense, given your time and your interest and everything you have to do, what would be the most helpful? I can give a big overview. Do you need the background on, on how we're built and what are our, our five appropriations? You just want to see the changes? Do you want to drill into anything in particular? Where, I can go any number of ways, but I want it to work for you guys. Well, um, I think that this all came about um, because there was a question on the part of, of uh, Representative Townsend uh, regarding a certain change. And I'm not sure, you know, how far into this we want to drill. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if Maida has gotten her answer so that she's satisfied with, uh, you know, with what's happening. And Maida, do you want to say a word about that? <laughs> well, my word. Um, I, I'm, I'm feeling quite a, a heavy load that my having posed an issue with you, Carolyn, re resulted in everyone needing to come together here. But I have to say, first of all, please, thank you so much for having me here. And I have gleaned so much very useful information for when we're doing our conversations in, um, in appropriations. I'm talking about with regard to the, the um, working lands piece, the two plus two farm to school. And I, we do have that $75,000 grant writer. Uh, that's that's a, a very key little, it's a tiny amount of money in the big picture, but a very key piece. And then all of this with regard to the stabilization grants, um, just really, really helpful. So thank you. Um, my question 
is with regard to um, what on the face of it in the big picture is a tiny amount of money. But um, un we understand in appropriations that, um, that uh, the department supports the, um, the, restate the restatement uh, GovRec budget. We understand that um, um, and, re and respect that. There are some of us on the committee, if not the entire committee, who are um, somewhat like uh, dogs with a bone, not willing to let loose of something once we've sunk our teeth into it. Uh, last March, before um, the State House shut down and our first try at the FY21 budget was shut down, one day away from having completed it. <laughs> um, we were trying to locate uh, the committee appropriations. We were trying to locate 280,000 additional dollars to help with parks, the state parks component of FPR, um, specifically to help with regard to support for seasonal workers, uh, the interpretive program, and contracted maintenance. And um, when we were looking at the, the restated FY21 budget, we were asking ourselves um, whether or not this um, issue still existed. Uh, was there, for instance, still um, a use for the $280,000 that we had been looking at in March, which was not part of the GovRec at that point in time. This was an initiative which we on appropriations were interested in. Um, so did, was there still this need for, from our perspective uh, for $280,000 additional dollars or not? So uh, um, it, it's at present my understanding that no, 280,000 additional dollars is, is not an issue because we've had the visit from the virus and that has changed the world. Whereas, I don't know if I understand correctly or not, but I, um, I have the impression that $71,000 could uh, still be put to use, making a difference for seasonal workers going into, um, going into the spring this is, this is not, we're not talking CRF money, we're talking uh, GF, the general fund. Um, uh, some, uh, the 71,000 would be the total of uh, some support for the seasonal workers, uh, steps and COLA in the spring, the, um, the, to restore the interpretive program, it's five to six people, um, which uh, had to be, um, which did not appear, was not included in the original uh, GovRec, the interpretive program being uh, the, 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 the employees who uh, help people understand what they're looking at when they visit the parks. Um, and then the third piece was contracted uh, maintenance that there's still um, a, a good use for that, we think, um, in, in, in that there may well be some, uh, there are, trees perhaps that are in bad shape that we need help taking care of. Um, uh, so, and we think the amount that would be useful is 71,000 and just trying to ferret out if that is indeed the case and if your committee would be thinking that that would be a good effort, it doesn't mean it could happen <laughs> that we find that money because I do have to underscore Every penny that we take, that we can find in general fund, uh, we have to balance against uh, a commitment which we have made to the Vermont State College system. Okay, I just need to lay that right out there because that's a, 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 a huge pressure that uh, we're committed to. Um, but in any case, I think that is the issue, Carolyn, or Madam Chair, excuse me, <laughs> sorry. Carolyn is fine, actually, okay. Maida. And, and, and so I, I 
in the context of, of, of the meeting here, and one, I apologize for folks. I hope you have found this meeting very, very useful and helpful. Um, but we haven't talked parks. Um, and I did ask uh, the chair of natural resources if I should be talking with them about this. And she pointed me to you. So yes, yes. I don't know if I'm a little hot potato on this or something, but here we are. Well, I think I think it's really valuable to have the conversation. I I really I, I so appreciate that Kitty gave you permission to be with us today because I think it, you know, the discussion has been good, and you I know you're very um, uh, detail oriented, and so uh, I feel that this has all been really positive. So I'm wondering, um, uh, Michael Snyder, if you wanted to comment on this. I see your face has gone away, and maybe even your whole self. Sam, are you still there? <laughs> Can you speak? Or Kristen is here. Um, I, I think Michael dropped off probably connection issues. Um, Looks like he's just there back. He is. He's, he's yeah. back. All right, Michael, I don't know if you heard what I said because I think you went away, but <laughs> anyway. Um, do you want to comment I'm, I'm on, on first Beta's? Go ahead. Yes. Are you able to hear me, all of you? Yes. Here? Really yes. apologize. I figured just unhooking and rehooking might solve it. Yes, this is, uh, thanks, Representative Townsend. And this is, I can, I can explain. So going back to when we originally sent in the 21 budget recommend from the administration, our part of that, um, you know, it was a different world. Uh, and we had significant pressures and we had cooked up an approach to try to meet those pressures that involved, um, you know, uh, the the con contracted services we said well there's fifty thousand dollars of that that we'll just we'll just have our own people do some of that work uh, that was she's mentioning hazard trees in campgrounds we have to manage those and uh, so mitigate the risk to to people etc uh, that whereas we don't have to uh, with a seasonal workforce uh, 400 some seasonals that help us manage the parks we don't have to but we have developed a tradition and it's part of our secret mm -hmm. sauce if you will of the success in the parks is to is to cultivate a high level seasonal workforce part of that is to provide them steps and colas that again we don't have to but it's been helpful to attract and retain high quality seasonal uh, workers so we said, you know what, that's just a luxury we can't afford this year. So we've proposed to freeze those steps and colas. Uh, and then we do have these very important seasonal employees who are naturalists, interpreters in the parks to help. And it's very pop popular with families and guests when they come to the parks to take advantage of that. We didn't like doing it, but again, it's, it's, it's important, it's helpful, but it's not core operations. And we were in a significant you know, pressure situation. So we had proposed that package of expenditure cuts in the parks uh, to meet the pressures that we were facing. Um, and we explained that and the committee was really great in their support and understanding of it. And that, that was the 200, that added up to about $280,000 in expense cuts that we were proposing um, uh, for those reasons. And the committee was wonderful about trying to find a way to help us with that, though we were clear that we weren't requesting it. We were good with the governor's recommend and supported it. Um, and so, but here we are coming through with the restatement and the world has changed. Uh, and so significant changes, including we didn't operate the parks until June 26th. We weren't able to open uh, as we would in late April and, and May traditionally. And so we're at, we know that's going to hurt us, our bottom line in revenues. That'll come back to roost in, 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 in 22. But the upside in 21 is that there was a, a there, we didn't have to pay people. Uh, we didn't have operating expenses. So, so some of our expenses changed in the, in, in the end of 20. Uh, and into, uh, that, so we, we, we were in a better position. In addition, we had new information from the USDA Forest Service and our federal allocations that whereas we had proposed, I think a $40,000, was it 40,000, Kristen, a reduction in federal. In this, now we have new federal advice that indicates it's a better picture for us with our federal assistance and we're able to project in the restatement an increase in federal funds. I'm simply indicating a couple different areas that changed with regard to expenses and, rev and projected revenues such that in the restatement we didn't have to put those, uh, those forward um, uh, to the same extent. And now what Representative Townsend is referring to is 
in talking with us, she, you know, drilling into it, she is good with the details. Uh, the oddity that emerges here is that we have operate this complex little business enterprise within state government, the state park system. It operates over two fiscal years. Our operating system season spans two fiscal years and it gets complicated when trying to project and, 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 and account. Um, but we're looking ahead in 21, we have several months in 21, the last couple of months of 21, next spring, will be the next operating system at, uh, season. And so, yes, uh, we have not budgeted for that in this proposal, but I think what Representative Townsend is referring to is $71,000 could, um, could uh, would help with about $12,000 to reinstate the, uh, the interpreters for that period. Um, we could do a $34,000 would allow us to provide those step increases, those pay increases to the seasonal workforce in the spring of 21. Uh, calendar 21. And about half of that contracted maintenance, maybe at $25,000, we could do some of that contracted work instead of having our folks do it. That adds up to the 71,000 that Representative Townsend is suggesting they could find to help us restore. So I hope that makes sense. That explains where we were, how we got to where we are now, and Representative Town, uh, Townsend's interest in trying to help us with a portion of that back in the, the last quarter, if you will, of the fiscal 21, which will be calendar 21, the spring when, uh, when we begin our operating season again. I'll pause there. Let me just ask Kristen Freeman, our amazing financial manager, if you wanna correct anything I said there or add anything, Kristen, we're good? We're good, all accurate. Thank you. And now I'll just open it up. Does that make some sense? And does that help with uh, the, the level setting here of the issues? It does, Michael, what was that? You, I think the last figure you gave was 25,000 for what? Contracted services, in particular, the hazard tree mitigation work. Uh, okay, that, thanks. You know, keep people safe in campgrounds when, you know, tr keeping trees alive in campsites can, can be a real challenge. And so we have to, we monitor that very carefully. We don't want trees falling on tents and lean-tos and campers. Okay, so I guess my next question is, um, Maida, what do you need from us? Do you need us to recommend that 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 seventy one thousand be found, or what what's needed here? Well, um, your recommendations to appropriations do, of course, need to reflect what your committee feels is is appropriate. Right. Um, we we would certainly welcome a recommendation, I think that's fair to say, that we would welcome a recommendation that we look for the 71,000 if, if indeed you folks believe that that's a legitimate uh, search. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to presume the will of the committee. It's just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it is that you need um, to, to move this forward. And John O'Brien's hand is up. Maybe if you wanna to respond to what I just said, that's fine, but. Sure, very um, succinctly, you'll be giving us your recommendations by the end of the day next Wednesday. Correct. Um, correct. Um, and we would not be a, a, averse to seeing the 71,000 there recommended if that's um, how the committee uh, sees it. Uh, you know that we on appropriations do our level best to be sensitive, to be very careful about being respectful to any recommendations brought to us by the policy committees. And if a policy committee recommends something, we do our darndest to carry through on it. If they do not recommend it, well then, even if we think it's something important, we may well more easily put it to the side. Okay, thanks for that. That's helpful. Uh, John O'Brien, your hand is up. Why don't you go ahead? I was just trying to get these numbers numbers uh, in my head. So, Michael, originally there was a state park systems budget for the uh, the pre-COVID budget, we'll call it, mm -hmm. and then at some point you needed to cut two hundred eighty thousand from that, and then oh. give it. Sorry, no, that, the, the, uh, the pre-COVID budget, the original presented governor's recommend for FPR for 21, which yeah. we presented last winter, that included 
about $280,000 of um, reductions, uh, uh, cuts to our, to what we had uh, to, to make up some, you know, the, to deal with the upward pressures in our budget. So that was what we had originally presented. And that's originally back in February, March, what the committee was working um, to say, well, you know, maybe we'd like to, we don't really, I think they basically said, we, we're we worried about this. We, we don't want you to do that. And um, that that's important stuff you're cutting. And, you know, that that was fair. And it, it, again, I appreciate that level of interest and support, um, even while that was our recommend. Uh, so that was what was then. And, uh, and, and then to the pre-COVID. So that's the 280. Then a bunch of things changed, including some of our, you know, our operating and therefore our expenses. We got better news from the feds. And internally, we've been working on a realignment in our forestry division that results in some savings. Uh, so we just said, okay, in fairness, this summer, as we relook at this, the world has changed and we're going to change too. So our new proposal doesn't have that same level of cuts. Um, that, that the 280, it's more like 71,000, I guess you could say, in these areas, fair enough. And that's what the committee is now saying, well, maybe continuing their interest in sort of filling those holes, they're looking to fill that hole, even though, you know, it's a smaller hole, if you will, and we've found other ways, so, so that the restatement is not just cutting, it's a rejiggering of how we're gonna make the cuts. Uh, is that helpful, Representative O'Brien? Yes, yeah, so, so essentially, with your rejiggering, um, and if we got you 71,000, you would more or less be level funded with last year's fiscal budget. No, we have an overall, we have a 3% general fund reduction that equates to just about $300,000 overall uh, in general fund. Uh, and- uh, For FPR, just the state park system. No, that's overall for FPR and okay. the parks, we are also going into, we are proposing to go into the parks fund, a special fund. Um, maybe I just, to take addition, an additional sum of uh, uh, parks fund money to use to, to, to balance our budget now. Uh, I should back out and just remember the parks appropriation, which is about $12 million for our operating costs, that is fueled by gate receipts, sales of services within the parks, firewood, ice, you know, the mugs, uh, you know, merchandise, <laughs> uh, rentals of kayaks and canoes, that sort of thing, right? And uh, that's to the tune of about 8 million that we grow ourselves of the 12. And then we have about 3 million or plus or minus a bit each year from our ski leases of seven ski areas that lease land from us. Uh, and then, you know, 5% uh, of, of it is general fund. Uh, and so, we so all those proceeds plus timber that we harvest uh, on park lands or special use permits and telecommunications licenses, those all go into the parks fund. And that's what we use to operate the, the parks pr principally with those sources plus some general fund help. This year, we're, gonna, we're proposing to hit that fund extra hard just to kind of work our way through. We like to maintain a buffer in that parks fund, a fund balance of several hundred thousand dollars because we don't control the weather. Uh, now we're learning there's many other things we don't control. So ski leases are weather dependent, those payments, as well as visitation to the parks. And so we need to be nimble through two op to an operating season that scans that spans two fiscal years to have that buffer. And so we are admitting that this is dangerous and we're concerned, especially with our reduction in revenues this year um, for a reduced park season and reduced offerings in the parks and not having so many out of state visitors come to enjoy the parks. So we're concerned about, you know, where the fund goes, but that's what the fund is for. And that's what we're proposing to use it. I, I hope that's a helpful overview and, and resetting here. Yes, very. So the back to the 71 then is that's what you recommend to cut or you could cut if you tightened your belt, but we could restore that. Right. I mean, it's it's a little complicated. Basically, yes. Uh, and uh, again, I need to be careful here. I, I am not proposing that. We are we are proposing the governor's recommend, and you all accept and understand that. Um, and um, but it, it, we we would only need the seventy one thousand, not that the two eighty. Remember, because it's too late in the season to apply those steps and colas to our seasonal workforce. So it's it's really not applicable at this point. And so that's part of the that's where it would come in is 
is on the on the back end of the season, if I have that right. Kristen, would you would you not in agreement or correct me there? Not sure. I can't see. She's frozen. Oh, uh, okay. And muted. <laughs> Kristen, if you can hear, um, you're frozen and you're also muted. So, <clears throat> okay, she just went away. Maybe she'll try and get back on. So, um, what I'm trying to explain is that whereas that was then, now we're so far into the operating season, we can't apply the, uh, it doesn't make sense to apply the, the steps and COAs. Um, and because of COVID, we didn't offer the, the interpreter program this year uh, because it's just not, we're not, there's many things that we scaled back on in the parks. We're thrilled that they're open and people are using them, but that's very much a different operating season. So for those reasons, it would be the 71,000 would be to allow those things uh, in the first few months of the park season at the end of fiscal 21. That help? Okay. Yep. Super helpful. Thank you, Michael. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions for Michael? Okay. I see hands up. Um, Maida. I, I just wanted to share with the committee, in case you're wondering why we are so in appropriations, so wed to our um, intense support for the state parks. I hope everyone under, under her, uh, I hope everyone understood what the commissioner said with regard to the, the funds which run our state park system. Our whole state park system is heavily dependent on that parks fund. It's very small, the amount in general fund money. So where we can, we'd like to try and support. Why? Because from our perspective, our state park system is, is one of the very, very important jewels in the jewels in Vermont's crown. Our state parks are a statement of who and what we are. So we, we try to do what we can in the little bit of GF that uh, we can. I would agree with you, Maida. <laughs> the parks are wonderful. <laughs> I really appreciate that we do, uh, and you know, to, to underscore it, it's uh, it, it's really important, and uh, it's quite a little deal we have going here. And um, I think what we're seeing this year is it's even more important uh, that uh, what the parks are providing, uh, and beyond that value proposition, that that the, the 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 social good that comes from the parks and the Vermont brand of our parks, um, it's also been tagged at $90 million in associated spending from that 1 million vis visitors a year. Um, so in addition to the eight plus million that we generate directly in that operation, there's, we've had a study, a UVM study suggests uh, up about a little more than $90 million annually in related spending to that park's visitation. Um, and you know, that's a lot in rural, there's a state park near every one of you in, in throughout Vermont, there's 55 developed state parks and in local communities, we know they're very important uh, as that little economic driver. So uh, not only health and wellness, family togetherness, environmental connectedness, um, there's a significant economic impact in, in from a, a return on this investment. So I'll get yeah. off my soapbox, but it, Representative Townsend got me going there, and it's 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 good stuff, and we appreciate that you recognize it. Well, we do, Michael, and we really appreciate everybody's work. Um, you said that the uh, parks opened in June. Was it the sixth or the twenty sixth? Twenty sixth is when we <laughs> opened. And remember, of the fifty five parks, um, most of them open around uh, traditionally on Memorial Day but about, I think, a 15 or 20 maybe open earlier than that. Um, uh, we have a few, you know, on, on the Connecticut River and others that, you know, we want to get people out early, so they open early. So that was a significant um, reduction in our, our season, um, but we, it wasn't just a temporal shrinking. We also chose, as we figured out how to, how to operate safely in the COVID world, um, we decided we could not, um, responsibly open with cabins and cottages, which are some of our most 
um, popular and sort of best revenue generating uh, in our overnight portfolio. So we yeah. did not offer the, just lean twos and tents and that's significant. And we started at reduced capacity, but density, if you will. So there was not only a shortened season, but we reduced what we were offering. We closed playgrounds, we closed, uh, you know, uh, any, any of our pavilions that are not open air pavilions. And, you know, so those are rentals. There's a lot that we didn't do. We just did the core operations of, you know, lean tos and, and tent sites, uh, but no interpreters. We didn't, we didn't even sell ice in some parks if there was some local provider of ice. We provided firewood and that was it, uh, which is not our normal model. Um, right. So now, again, looking ahead to 22, we have to keep an eye out that the revenues are down. We caught a break because some of our expenses were down because we had this reduced operating, but our revenues are down as well. And I'm, we also need to keep an eye on what the ski season will bring. We're not sure what it will look like at our seven ski area partners um, and their ability. I think we're fine for 21, but because of the nature of the timing of the payments. But 22, this winter season, um, you know, that's going to be uh, important too. I think my bottom line message here is you still have time to go to the parks, tell your friends and neighbors, visit the parks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> every bit helps. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, Maida's hand is up and John's is, and it is after 10.30, which is typically our time to uh, depart, but I'll let these two questions be asked and answered. And, um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about next week because we may need more time to meet to come to our, uh, our agreement. So Maida, do you wanna ask your question? I, I just lowered my hand. I forgot to take it down, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, John. Right. Michael, uh, well, one, one quick aside, Emily and I visited your new estate park, Taconic Ramble on Monday, which was awesome. Over Fantastic. Yeah, um, I'm glad you did. Did you get around uh, up into the woods or just down to the Zen Garden? And No, we went up Mount Zion. It was nice. wonderful. Fantastic. Um, but a, a question. Um, You've described the state park system sort of as a, a mini business within government. Uh, it is indeed. Are there any federal COVID relief dollars, you know, for for your economic harm within that business? I know government's not really eligible, but it, in this case, it seems like it would be totally appropriate. Uh, good question, and for sure, um, but not for lost revenues. We had received a million, 1.3 million for PPE and some infrastructure changes to allow us to, it was very helpful to buy supplies for sanitization, for portalettes. Uh, you know, we, we, we had to change our whole operating to, to deal with COVID. And so we got 1.3 million in the Supplemental Budget Adjustment Act uh, that has been very helpful. That's CARES Act money for uh, PPE, sanitization, et cetera, not lost revenues. Uh, and now, in, in the, along with the forest economy stabilization grants, the outdoor recreation business grants, we also uh, got, in, in that round, as you guys finished up uh, earlier this summer, uh, $3 million of CARES Act funding for additional COVID response on public lands, state lands. Uh, so forests, parks, and wildlife uh, management areas and fishing accesses to do, uh, to recover from damage when we weren't open, there were a lot of people using and there was significant damage, whether it was torn up lawns and soft ground or, you know, litter, a variety of things that, you know, that are a little disappointing to reflect on our fellow humans. But uh, there was some recovery uh, and then the additional signage and guidance for COVID precautions, et cetera. So we are now beginning, um, uh, we have uh, uh, between us and Fish and Wildlife, uh, that $3 million of projects contracted out across uh, state lands, but again, not which some of which will be applied in parks, but it doesn't help in any way. It's not eligible to cover um, uh, uh, the, the lost revenues that are significant. One last piece is that we made a request and Representative Townsend could speak to this. Um, they were very helpful that we made a request that we had to refund if, you're, if you think about how we book reservations for the parks, we're booking now for next summer. So we had a lot of money come in for reservations from April, May, and most of June that we couldn't honor. So 
though we didn't have to, we refunded. We made all those reservations whole. We told people, you have a choice. We'll, we'll cut you a check. We'll give you a credit to come back, and we hope you will, or you could donate it. Uh, and that originally, we had put in for about $800,000 in refunds that was approved uh, through CARES funding. And, and now we've, we've made a subsequent request for the rest of the, what we've realized is to a total of about 1.3 million in, in refunds that we'd love to be able to recover. And that would go a long way to helping this budget that we're talking about. My understanding now is that it's in question as to whether refunds are actually eligible or are they, um, uh, is it seen in an accounting sense as, um, uh, unactuated revenues, I guess, is what they called it, something to that. And I think it's in question right now. So that piece of refunds is another one to be aware of. And whereas for our time, it looked very positive that we were going to get CARES Act funding to cover those, I, my sense is now it's being seen as, no, that's revenue, lost revenue, and that's not eligible. So that's the total package there, John, on, sorry, Representative O'Brien, on um, you know, are we, is there funding help? It's very been very helpful for COVID kind of precautions and sanitization, which is really key, um, but not for our operations or for lost revenues. Okay, <clears throat> Vicki's hand is up and now this really has to be the last question. <laughs> yeah, thank you for just taking this last thought. So Michael, I'm just curious about the advertising for state parks that you might normally do in a normal year um, to get people to come into the state? What, how did you adjust advertising or did you need to? I appreciate the question because um, it's really important and it's one of the elements of our success. I, I, as I'd like to add this, you should know in 10 years, the last 10 years, we have seen a 40, over a 40% increase in visitation to the parks. And that's with zero marketing money. We do a lot of marketing. It's creative, it's innovative, uh, and it is cheap. <laughs> and I'm really <laughs> proud of it. But so like we do barter with VPR. We, they, you'll, you'll hear they, they use, we give them some access to some, they can give premiums to their supporters of park passes. They give us great billing on their prime time, Vermont State Parks, right? We have a variety of approaches. We do really well, our team, it's not me, uh, our sales and marketing folks on social media, um, tens of thousands of followers. It's extremely pos uh, positive. And so we do it. We're keeping at it. We're changing the message slightly to reflect the, the, the health precautions, but it, mm -hmm. it's not a budgetary concern. It's, um, there is interest. You'll see elsewhere in the administration's budget, there have been proposals for marketing and tourism and marketing for hunting and fishing for state parks and outdoor recreation. So there are some elsewhere in the budget uh, proposals for some marketing and we'd, we'd love to partner with Fish and Wildlife and Tourism and Marketing to enhance our marketing. But to your basic point, no, it's not been, we're continuing to do it, but it's in as much as we don't have a budget for it, there isn't a budget implication here in the COVID world. Thank you, Mike. You bet. Good job. All right, All <laughs> right everybody. <clears throat> I think this has been a really um, a good meeting. I see some questions that we will need to discuss and answer. Uh, and I think I'm looking at action steps at this point. So I think one of the things we need to know from um, you, Michael and Sam, are if there are any tweaks to the uh, forest stabilization uh, grants uh, forest economy stabilization grants, are there any tweaks to that that you want? Because they have to happen quickly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> committee, we have to discuss uh, working lands and that there be uh, additional money if it's available uh, for the working lands grants. Uh, we've heard, uh, I know that everybody's uh, I'm hearing, I'm looking, I'm seeing that my internet connection is unstable. I don't know if you all can hear me. Can you hear me? Moment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop my video. Maybe that'll make things better. Um, so we need to um, talk about that. We, I don't think we would come up with a number, but we've heard and we understanding that uh, both agencies or, or the department and the agency are supporting the governor's recommend um, as presented, uh, 
we would potentially request that they add more money to working lands because it's down at 594, 594,000. And uh, we've heard that there's a need for, um, we've heard from Rodney that there's a potential need for more uh, money for agriculture. And we've heard that there might be uh, some more investments in uh, infrastructure for our forest products indus industry. And then we also need to discuss the $71,000 for um, that we've just been uh, talking about for the parks. So um, there may be other things that we need to discuss and I'd, I'd really like you to, you know, I, I might not just be thinking about it at the moment, but please email me um, if, if there's something you wanna discuss. Um, Linda suggested that maybe we would need to meet uh, Tuesday morning as well. I don't know if that's a possibility for you all, but I think we need to have some committee discussion. I, I really want to be very prompt with providing approps with uh, our recommendation and by close of business on Wednesday. So, um, you know, if, if you are available, that would be great Tuesday morning. I'm not sure about uh, if we could find a slot to do that, but uh, I suspect that Linda might be working on that as we speak. So um, any other things that are responses to what I've just said, uh, any th other things you wanna talk about? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. So uh, why don't we end this meeting today? I really wanna thank everybody for participating. I think this has been really, really helpful um, as we try and pull things together. And um, we'll potentially see you Tuesday morning, definitely Wednesday morning at 8.30. So thanks everybody. And Linda, you can take us off.